Um, so my, well, our next guest is uh, Louis Lancaster. So for those who don't know, um, Louis had an absolutely fascinating career, um, a career that I, I guess a lot of us can empathise with a little bit more or um, understand a little bit more than... Um, than a sort of superstar player because Louis almost been been one of us. I think it's fair to say he had a sort of modest career in, in sort of youth football and non-league football, but his um, becoming an elite coach and has already had some unbelievable and incredible experiences. So um, when I if I say to you, and I know we've got an educated crowd here, so if I say to you, you know, he's been the assistant manager of Taiwan, you'll say, well, that's actually fucking incredible. You know, um, if I say to you, he's been, you know, had a season in the Chinese second tier, likewise, you'll say, fuck, that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, so hopefully we're going to find out how he did that. Um, so, Louis, first of all, tell us um, briefly, when did you decide you wanted to coach? Uh <coughs> Well, my first feel, real memory of football was the Italian 90. And the first player I remember was Scalacci, Baggio. So I always played. It was natural, down the park, four jumpers and play. And then I remember it was about 14 because uh, my parents ran a, a community football club, Grassroots. And I was just there to help out on my brother's team. So I was collecting balls, collecting cones. And then I think it was just natural to start getting involved. And I think it was there where I found my vision straight away. This is for me. There was no drifting around. I didn't want to be anything else, just football. And when did you decide to sort of try and get those qualifications? When did you decide, rather than just being sort of a guy who wants to sort of organise or put the cones out, when did you think, I'm going to do my FA Level 2 or whatever it first was? Well, I remember at 18, I went to University at Bath. I studied sports coaching and exercise science. And I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do. And then eventually uh, on the course, we actually did a Level 1. And I got home and I started a company. So basically in, in secondary schools, teachers have free periods. So they do all their marking, their whatever they need to do. But in primary schools, my wife's a primary teacher, they don't get free periods. And then they introduce something called PPA time. So now in primary schools, that teacher gets a free period. So I would provide a service to the school. I would go in, take that PE lesson. Then well, for that teacher, had to have time. And then the next teacher, I'd take her slot. Yeah. And then to do that job, I had to be qualified in football, then I did all the games, all the invasion sports. So I was doing netball, basketball, football. I did striking and fielding games such as rounders and cricket, gymnastics. And I have to say, all of those sports has had a, a contribution to my development as a football coach. Well, that's really interesting because that's I know this is sort of a school of thought in coaching, football coaching, that um, both players who are, who are all-rounders and coaches who are all-rounders are actually better because of it because they can sort of apply lessons from other sports into football. And would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, in uh, the biggest one for me in football, I, I sometimes play a lot of games in hands because if you make a mistake on the pitch and this guy makes the same mistake, the coach can see it as the same. But actually, the situation could be completely different. So you'll only know by asking the question. So, you know, who, what, when, where, why. So, for instance, the space is over here. So if I say to you, where's the space? You'll say it's over there. Now, I know it's not a decision-making problem. I now can identify that probably as a technical problem. Whereas this, this kid over here say, oh, the space is over there. Now I know it's a decision-making problem. So I play a lot of games in my football training sessions in hands because now they've got no stress of the feet. The technique is completely out of the equation. And it gives you an opportunity as a coach to assess the brain. So basically the you're, playing, you're playing football but without the feet. Exactly. Just, I find sometimes the ball comes, they've got so much stress around it. Just take away that out. And then you'll get to see the decisions they make. And sometimes you could see a completely different player. So the guy who's pinging through sort of long-range, beautiful through passes with his hands actually has the vision but might not have the, exactly. the so, technique. Like for on instance, the feet. one player will come to light and you're like, well, it's clear now he can make decisions, but he can't do it because his feet aren't prepared. What happens before he receives the ball, during and after? And it, it just, it's a good opportunity. I think it's a good little spin to assess the player. So when did you um, start taking the football qualifications, if you like, seriously? When did you start going to that sort of, you know, uh, UEFA level and, and that sort of thing? Well, the qualifications have changed now. In, in my day, it was do level one, then the level two was six aside, the B license was nine aside, and then you'll move to your A license, which is 11 aside. So I, I did my A license in 2010. Uh, which was a fascinating course, and I had a great mentor at the time. You know, some people just take a shine to you. I took a shine to this guy. His name was Dick Bate. And he's, he's actually got the worst managerial record in the history of the Football League. 
but he's regarded as the best coach educator across the world. He's known by everyone and he's, he's been brilliant for me and my, my development. And then what he wanted to do, he wanted to set up an elite course. So it goes level one, two, B license, A license, and then you get your pro license. But the pro license is to pre prepare people for football management. So they look at, I don't know, interviews, how to, I don't know, uh, media training and things like this. Where he believed, he wanted, he thought that the, you could do the A license, but have a real advanced step into coaching. So how do you work with an individual? How do you just work with a back four? You know, how do you work on relationships with a right back and a right winger? So he selected, in his opinion, the 16 top candidates across the country to come together and, and do how, this course. How was, how, why do you think you were picked? You know, why, why do you think you were picked as one of those 16 most promising, most talented, whatever? Uh, I think it's down to connection. I think, well, I'm sure we're going to come onto it later. But all the teachers have the same qualifications, but we all have a favourite teacher. And I just think it's the way you connect with someone. You know, it's all, uh, all the immeasurable stuff. We can measure this and measure that, but you can't measure how honest someone is, how much courage they have, how much, how honest are they, how trustworthy they are, and I think, I think that separates people. So it's almost your personal skills uh, can help you as much as your sort of technical know-how. For sure. I just want to ask you something because um, when you Google Louis's name, uh, another name comes up quite a lot, um, and it's understandable when you hear who, who, who that other name is. Um, so Jaden Sancho, uh, Obviously, Man City now doing uh, very well in Germany, but you knew him at Watford, that's right? Yeah, so I went to Watford Football Club at, uh, in 2013, and Jaden at the time was under 14. So as a club, we made a decision to challenge him and move him up an age group, because his ability was just on another level. Well, tell us about that. I mean, it, I mean, obviously, everyone at Watford is good. So how was he better than everyone else? How was he like, even in you know Watford, which is obviously full of fantastic players, how did he... You know, how, did, how, how was he better than everyone else? Uh, firstly, I was, I was drawn to him immediately because everyone is, every coach I've met is, uh, I don't know, fascinated with different things. So, for instance, someone might be fascinated with defending. Someone might be fascinated with someone who's got, you know, Jabby Lonzo, a great passer. Well, I'm fascinated with dribblers and people that can produce moments of brilliance when it comes to the crunch. And he, 1v1, I haven't seen anyone like it. We say move the ball. He, he doesn't, he moves his body. He, you, I don't know. I don't even think you can teach it. Is that is that natural? So a guy who can sort of skin someone with sort of the blink of an eye is that natural, or is he is he being coached at some level, or is it just something you'd pick up in the playground as a kid? I, I think a great coach can improve a player ever so slightly, but I think an awful coach can ruin a player a lot. And I think these you know playstations are taking over now, and some some of the kids you know when we were younger, I think they develop a lot of these stuff these things themselves. I mean. At Watford, we had a school, so this, the Watford would educate the players, would train them in the morning, educate them, train them in the evening. And he's in an English lesson, and he'll, he'll be watching YouTube, Ronaldinho. <laughs> You'd give him the look, you know, the window comes down, you walk off, you turn back, it's straight back up. And he just wanted to, he was fascinated with 1v1s as well. I remember sitting down with him, and because um, my, my job as a coach is to obviously add value and make him a better player. So I sat down with all the players, and I think no matter what industry you're in, if you're trying to improve someone, you must know the answers to these three questions. And the first question is, you have to identify who exactly you're working with. So it was clear to me that he was very driven, he was courageous, fearless, and he had to be challenged. If you didn't challenge him, he would let you know about it. And as a football coach, sometimes if the kids are messing around, it's easy to say their attention span is short, they're not listening. Well, actually, sometimes we need to look at ourselves because they haven't got a ball at their feet, they're in a queue, they're waiting and it's boring. So that, that was very clear to me. Second question was, what is the dream? What do you want to do? And he looked at me in the eye and said, Look, I want to play for one of Europe's top clubs and represent my country to make my family proud. And that was it. And then the third thing I think which is the trick is, well, what is it we can do to bridge the gap and add, value, add, add something to your development to get you there? And now everything I've just said, I think the key word is the word add. Because you can say to someone, uh, Owen, amazing, you nutmeg that player, went round two other players, but, and I think as soon as you say that word but, especially to a child, their body is there, but their mind is elsewhere. They're not even there now. They're not listening. So you can say exactly the same message with a, just a little twist, and you can say, Owen, brilliant, you knocked that player off the ball, you've recovered, you've played that ball down the line, and I've noticed something we can add to your game. And you can say exactly what you want now, same message, just a little spin. So it's and rather than but. Yeah, that, that was a real 
Jaden was all positivity. It had to be positive. I remember I would talk to him for 10 seconds. So I want to talk to this player, improve him. And after 10 seconds, he wasn't listening. He's looking in the sky and I think, well, what's the point in talking to him after 10 seconds? So I said to myself, right, I can talk to him as many times as I like, but only for 10 seconds. But it had to be positive. So it was, oh, Jaden, that was an amazing trick. Brilliant. Show me that later. Gone. So every time he left me, it was always positive. Every time. And then after a month, he, come, he started coming to me. And I thought, oh, here we go. I know what he wants. So then I thought, well, if he's coming to me now, I'll up my game a little bit. So I'll give it 20 seconds. But what I'll do is I'll throw some positive, something we can add, and finish with a positive. And that was how we kind of worked. Is it any surprise to you? Because obviously I was I had to Wikipedia him today to check how old he was. I mean, he's only 18. Um, and it already seems like, you know, he's played what, a couple of times for England now. Obviously doing very well in Dortmund. Um, is it a surprise to you? Or did you honestly expect this? No, I honestly expected it. So in football at the moment, I mean, it's crazy. There's, there's so many different age ranges in this room, but we could all probably get on the football pitch and compete. Whereas, you know, you look at... Uh, so I've just got a little niece born. She's this big. And, like, she, my, other, my other friends is one. And the difference in one year at that age is com it's unbelievable. So Jaden was actually born in March. So he's competing with players that are born in September and October. So, you know, they're going to be bigger quicker, stronger, and I think being born in March has helped him because he's had to develop coping mechanisms. We find so many players that, you know, that for me, the brain trumps everything, and you find young players who have a strong influence on the game, but it could be through speed and power. But when it comes, when everyone has speed and power, they've got no brain, they can't make the decisions, where the smaller players in academies, their technique is incredible because it has to be. And that's a trend, isn't it? I mean, you know, some of the best players coming through now are, are well under six foot and 12 stone you know that's so that do you see that as a, as a coach do you see that as a trend that you know smaller players are coming to the fore a bit more yeah I the trick is I remember doing my pro license and I, w I was fascinated with Mavericks so my question was that I had to answer was what is a Maverick and how do you get the best out of them and what I did I spoke to all the managers that I could that have worked with Mavericks then I spoke to players that have played with Mavericks and then I spoke to the Mavericks themselves and I got hold of a, a guy called Alberto Capellas, and he completely changed my thinking on football. And he was the academy manager of Barcelona. So he's got Messi, Busquets, Xavi, Iniesta, all these amazing players. And I said to him, how did you produce Lionel Messi? And he said, simple, we just made sure he was surrounded by the most intelligent players. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, in England, you may choose uh, a player who has a strong influence on the game. You might choose a big boy at under 14, pace and power, and he's had a good game through that. But that wouldn't work for Messi. We had to surround him with a high level of intelligence. And he says, which is quite true actually, he says, that's why Lionel Messi produces for Barcelona, because it's high. But when he plays for Argentina, the level of intelligence around him reduces. And I thought about that and I thought, I thought, well, hang on. In the Premier League, we've got Lampard, Scholes, Owen, Ferdinand, Beckham, all these amazing players. They're incredible, world players. But they all produce for their clubs but they're surrounded by Drogba, Makaleli, top players. So when they play for their clubs, is the level of intelligence around them really high? But when England players get together, does the level of intelligence reduce? And I, I just think it's a little spin. And I, I remember being absolutely fascinated with this. So I did a little rondo square. For some of you who don't know, it's just a square, a player on each side and one player in the middle, so there's five players. And their job is to keep the ball. And I chose at the time at Watford, the most intelligent under 12s and 13 players. So they're tiny little dots. And I got the two players from under 16s who have the most influence currently in the games. They were big and strong. They've gone in the middle. They couldn't get the ball. And then when it did break down, because obviously it does, they would come out, two others would go in, and when it broke down, it was always with the under 16s. And it just completely changed my mindset on, well, it confirmed to me that the brain trumps everything. Absolutely fascinating. We could probably talk about that all night, but it's called Great Football Adventure. So I want to get on to um, some of your foreign jobs. Um, so you were in the, you were part of the FA Elite badge. Um, you were one of 16 picked. Um, so tell me how you went from that to your first overseas job, which I believe was in China. China, yeah. So tell me how that came about. <clears throat> so on courses, I always recommend to people go on as many courses as you can because. Not only will you get some value from the course, or even if you don't, it's no problem. 
but you're going to meet so many people and you can never afford to never be at your best because you never know when that phone's going to ring from someone you met three years ago where you left a lasting impression. And I remember I completed my elite license, then my pro license, and you know, you've got to stay in contact with people, WhatsApp, and, and then Gary White called me at three in the morning. Uh, he just landed a job in China. So obviously they were seven hours ahead, and he calls me up, I answer the phone, and he says, uh, he says, look, Louis, I've got an opportunity for you. Uh, you need to go and splash your face, wake up, I'll call you back in five minutes. And then he hung up. And it's probably just a good time to interject and say that Gary White, for those who don't know, um, has been very successfully the manager of, I think, Bahamas, British Virgin Islands, Guam, um, subsequently Taiwan, and is currently Hong Kong, and he's a sort of super successful uh, English coach abroad. So, so he says, I'm going to call you back in five minutes. What happened? So he calls me. My wife says, go downstairs. I've got two kids asleep upstairs. And then he says to me, um, look, I want you to be my first team coach. Uh, this is why. I think you're brilliant, blah, 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 blah. These are the numbers. I need an answer in 20 minutes. <laughs> and, and at that stage, you had, what, a wife? How many kids? Wife's asleep. So I go upstairs, nudge her. She thinks it's for something else. <laughs> I said, no, 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 it's not that, I promise. <laughs> I'm not in the mood. Not tonight. So, um, so I call him back and say, look, that's, that's ridiculous. I can't give you an answer in 20 minutes. I'll give you an answer by 10 o'clock. I'll either say yes or no, I won't fuck around. So you need to move on. So uh, I call him back and then 10 days later I'm in, I'm in China. And then when, when you're coaching in football, I don't know what, what industries you're in, but I'm sure you have passion to go to the top. My advice would be to anyone, do you really want to do it? Because I hear coaches all the time saying, I want to get to the first team level, I want to get there. And this is how I live my life and my family. Every, every penny we earned this month funded next month. And then everything next month funded the next month. And I signed a contract in China. And in my contract, it said, if we lose three games in a row, we can get sacked with no compensation. So I fly out on the Thursday. I fly to Inner Mongolia, and we lose on the Saturday. Two games to go. <laughs> I'm thinking, OK. <laughs> then we lose the next game. So I've just lost two games, my first two games in professional football, knowing that I live my life month to month financially. And then... I remember at training, the boss walks down. I don't know how to describe him. He was, I think he's the 50th richest man in Shanghai. Gold chain, spliffy jeans. <laughs> I, I don't know if they were spliffy, but you can imagine the sort of guy I'm, I'm, I'm painting a picture of. And we're doing training, and he just goes, stop. And everyone just stops. He brings everyone in. And uh, I, I don't know, I couldn't read the Chinese or hear it, but I, I know what he said after. And he basically said, if you win this weekend and keep a clean sheet, I'll put a million yen extra in the bonus. And that's £115,000. We won 5-0. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that must have been a good night. Good night in Shanghai. Very good night. <laughs> um, and so you, you did a season there. How did that end? Was that just like a natural sort of end of the contract or, or, or was it a bit more sort of antagonistic than that? How did it end? Uh, well, firstly, I'll just, if I could just quickly go back to Jaden, actually. Because it's easy to assume that coaches have helped players get to where they want to go. And I get that's part of the process. Obviously, it's their family and themselves. But actually, he's helped me. Because when we got to China, I don't know if any of you are football coaches, I don't know if you've coached Brazilian players, but they can be very challenging. And I've got to say thank you to him, because he helped prepare me for what was coming. Right. They're very challenging. They're, they're very, I would describe them as assassins. Like if they win a game of football, they want to get paid immediately. And one of the players, Biro Biro, is worth $20 million, incredible player. And he described it like this. He says, look, if your washing machine breaks, the guy comes around, fixes it, you pay him. If I win a game of football, it's the same. If I scored a winning goal, you need to pay me. They're just assassins. Uh, but as I said, Jaden definitely helped me prepare for that environment because it's intense. It's very intense. And so it ended in China. When then did you get the call to go out to Taiwan, which I believe was your next job with Gary? Is that right? Yep. So Taiwan finished, and then uh, sorry, China finished. Um, a little bit of a difficult situation. I just think the China League's a, a lot different to the Premier League. So the Championship Player Final, I think, is the most expensive game. 
So if you go up, you get funded for that. If you get down, you get funding. Whereas in China, they don't have those TV rights. They don't have that, that funding behind it. So I don't, think the, I don't think the boss shared the same ambitions as us, if that made sense, being political. And, and so did Taiwan come about because Gary got the job and then gave you a call and said, yep. come with me? Yeah, so Gary got the job then in Taiwan. Uh, I got the call and then, then I'm off on my travels again in, in Taiwan. And how is it, what is it like when you're leaving? I think you're from Hertfordshire, you're living in Hertfordshire. What's it like when you're leaving your wife? And I know you've got two kids now when you're leaving them behind and having to sort of say, I'll see you in six months or three months or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, I think three months was the longest period, but I don't think, uh, you couldn't do that job without FaceTime and Skype. I mean, it's a real game changer. It's difficult. Like, do you have nights when you sort of start Tuesday night at home thinking, what am I doing? Yeah, but it's not just that. I mean, like, you, if you come back home and see your friends, they haven't changed. They're doing the same job. You speak to Steve, he's in the same job. He's, he's always m moaning. Whereas if you come home and see your kids after three months out of two and four, they've completely changed. There's words, vocabulary you haven't even seen. Suddenly they're doing roly polies. So, so does that ever make you think, do you know what? fuck this, I'm going to get a job in Tesco, I'm going to get a job, you know, I'm going to get an office job, 20 grand a year, 30 grand a year, whatever, rather than this, chasing this dream on the other side of the world? It's a difficult one. I, I think the ultimate dream is to be together. My wife and I come to a point and said, look, it doesn't matter where we are as long as we're together. Because at first, I don't know if you've been to China, it's, it's not everyone's cup of tea. And when you play in, in a team, you get to visit all of China. Whereas some people in China, I think, not, I think only 10% of Chinese people have visited over two-thirds of China. And then I think the dream is to be together. Now, I, some people have made that jump as a family. And I was meeting children that are six years of age. And they're fluent in like four languages. And Mandarin is the most difficult language. You're not, you're not going English to Spanish or German to whatever. But you it speak a little bit, different. don't you? You've, you've picked up quite a bit. A little bit. A little bit. A little bit. Okay. But a little yeah. bit. I can order a beer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but it's but but you're saying you know you could see yourself doing that, taking the family out, getting those kids multilingual at a young age, and 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 that's something you might want to do going forward. Kids are sponges. These kids are six. They pick it up. For instance, uh, to describe the Chinese language, I'm not not professional, but in our dictionaries we have a lot of words, but they have less words, but they have tones. So, for instance, if you say a trouser. I know trousers, it means trousers, but if you say it with a different tone, it could mean a car. If you say it in another tone, it could yep. mean a pint of beer. So you've got all these words in the sentences, and there's four tones to a word. So it, it's very difficult. But I, I, would, I would love nothing more than my children to speak fluent Mandarin. I just want to ask you one question about a game, and then we'll open it up to everyone. Um, there's, a, there's a game, and I really uh, recommend you watching it on YouTube. So... Um, I'm not sure if it was the first, but one of, the, one of Gary and, and Louis' first game in, uh, in Taiwan, before they got there, they got pumped 5-0 off Bahrain, uh, and then they played them at home, um, and they went 1-0 down after 17 minutes. I know because I checked. They went 1-0 down after 17 minutes. Um, well, and then they get to the 87th minute, 1-0 down, and, then, and tell us what happened. <laughs> well, actually, the day that, that was such a fitting story because the 10th of October is Taiwan's national day, and they... You know, most countries, when it's a national day, they go bonkers, they celebrate. And before this actual game, the 9th of October is my birthday. So we've been with the team now two weeks. And I remember uh, the, the staff's table's here. The captain comes up. They all give me a cake. And sing happy birthday, da-da-da. And then another cake come out. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit gullible. I'm not the most brightest. And then they were like, go and blow it out. And what they wanted to do was put my head in it. <laughs> Bearing in mind, I've known these these people two weeks. And I thought, you cheeky bastards. <laughs> and then, so what happened was, I, I kind of resisted it, and I just saw red. And I picked up this cake, and I'm throwing it around the room, like a proper catering room. These round tables, I'm throwing it, and our two centre midfielders sprinted, and they clashed over the same chair and bumped heads, and they're down. The day before the biggest game in their history. And I was like, oh, shit. And they're down, they've had to see the physio and everything. And it was all touch and go whether they could play or not. <laughs> Gaffer's like, why do you throw the cake? I was like, well, fucking, why do you tell him to put my head in it? First flight back to yeah. England, yeah. And then what happened was, so that was that. Thankfully, they could play. I was panicking. And then the 87th minute come, bosh, we score one all. And I've seen the video. You go nuts at just the equaliser because a draw would have been a fantastic result for you guys. Yeah, a fantastic result. And then 
out of nowhere, we score again. And we win the game 2-1. It's, uh, it's, it's gone down in history record books. National Day, 10th of October, 2-1 win. And as I said, they lost 5-0 before. 2-1 then, it put us in a great position. And the moments like that, is that sort of the reason you're not working in Tesco? I don't want to work in Tesco. You don't want to work in BT. You, you want to chase that dream because you know that sort of unbelievable moments you can get when you're on the touchline with a fantastic win like that. Yeah, I mean, as, as Steve said, you, if you want to work in Tesco's, that's fine. But if you want to do this, that's fine. But if you don't have a clear vision, I just think you'll just drift around and you'll never really, really be satisfied and happy. So, you know, I, I want to take that plunge. I want to take that step. If it doesn't work, I've got to have a clear conscience that I've done everything I can. And if it doesn't work, then I can hold my head high. If I didn't give my best, you never want to fail like that. And, but then on the flip side, you live for moments like that but you can only get there if you make the jump. Um, I want to open it up. I know we haven't got long, so uh, any questions uh, from the audience, please shout. Thank you. They say in coaching that you should prepare the player for the pathway. And I think what, because it doesn't change. So coaches are coaching the players, but they also need to, I think, in my opinion, mentor the players because they've got tough decisions to make. But I think what's happening now is some of these players are saying, no, 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 I don't like that prepare the pathway for the player. It, it should be prepare the pathway for me because they're, they're kind of changing it and putting their own spin. And we were, I was talking to Steve earlier. He can't get an opportunity because he only gets three or four games. Whereas in the Bundesliga... These managers at 32, 33, they get time. They'll get five, six, seven, eight games, whatever it is. So they can play the youth players. They can have time knowing there's less pressure. And what happens is they're 34, they get such a high profile, they'll then come to the Premier League. So I think players like Jaden, they'll just do the same as the managers. They'll build their profile, Reese Nelson. They'll go over there, build their profile, and then now they can be trusted. Now they can come across. But surely they should be able to do that in the Premier League. Oh, of course, 100%. But this manager's, you know, he's got a mortgage, he's got kids, he's got a lifestyle. You know, if, if the tyre goes in my car, I pay £80, I get a new tyre. If the tyre goes in his car, he's got to spend two grand. And it's, everyone lives to their means, it's all relative. And he can't trust that player because he only gets three games. Anyone else? I think it's, it's impatient. People want short-term and not long-term. But then it, you can, you can complement it in another way. So you might have a small player that needs this guy, the big guy. So you might have to help him. But really, it's, it's this. So When, when I was working with Jaden, after he left, my job at Watford changed. I was an, an individual developer. So my job was to purely produce individuals. Forget about the teams. So I said to the boss, look, how many players have Watford produced in the last 10 years? Oh, 55, 57, brilliant. Okay, how many have produced uh, over a million pound in revenue or played 50 times for the first team and contributed that way? Uh, one, Ashley Young. I said, so if you've got an academy of 70 players, why are you investing time, effort and energy in 70 players? I know you've got to give them a duty of care, but my role was to develop the individual. So every player will have a head coach and an assistant coach. And what that role did for me was it, 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 I got quite ruthless in differentiating the difference between sport for all and sport for the elite. Because you're, it, a club can't keep giving you £2 million every year to run an academy and not give it anything back. You wouldn't give me £1,000 a month. You'd just keep doing it. I'd have to give you something back. And I think that's the difference. So my role was to literally target the individuals and get them to the next level. Uh, one more, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, going back a number of years, obviously Belgium were bringing in three players that obviously raised hands for you, so you don't want to the ball now. In terms of pound for pound nations out there that are in emerging areas, emerging countries, who, who, who are the countries to look at in terms of um, doing really well? 
Well, I've got to say now, England have proved they're the best youth development programme in the world. Unbelievable. Uh, we were talking just before, so I've played, I've been to some strange places. I've been to Turkmenistan. I, I never even heard of it before I went there. Uh, I've been to Malaysia, and what you'll find is England have the best facilities, we have the best coaches, we have the best everything, da, 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 and we are producing players, we're doing really well. However, these other countries, I don't know how they do it, but they still find a way to produce gems. So, for instance, there's two players in uh, Malaysia, they were just incredible. Now, they have the same environment as every other player, but how do, what, what makes it tick? Why, why them? And I think what we were talking again, it, it comes down to the, the immeasurable stuff. So when you're working with Jaden Sancho or any player, you count their passes, count their shots. The, the GPS monitor is amazing. They did this many sprints, they ran that far. But that doesn't matter. It's the stuff you can't measure. Jaden was so competitive and challenging. All kids are the same. Kids need to be challenged. On a computer game, they're on level one. If they complete level one, they go to level two, and so on and so on. And then invest shitloads of time in their bedroom get into the next level you know that their, 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 so, their motivation to get to the next level and when they get to the final stage of that game and they beat Bowser in the Donkey Kong castle that game has no place in their life anymore because it, they, it can't challenge them they've completed it so that game goes in a draw it gets sold on eBay to generate money for the next game because that game cannot make them any better now they've got a new challenge and I think as coaches Whatever industry you're in, you have to challenge people to get the best out of them. Otherwise, they'll see through you. They'll just say, no, you're not for me. You can't, you can't add to me. You can't, you can't do anything for me. So when are England going to win the World Cup? Sorry? When are England going to win the World Cup? I honestly think 22. Excellent. Let's look forward to that. Right, I think that brings a lovely end to it. Thank you so much, Louis, and thanks, Seth. <laughs>